right here. So I did a little bit different this week. If you have your phones, you can actually scan that QR code, and I'll actually bring up all the notes for this message this week. And then once you pull it up on your Bible app, you can actually save it. You should be able to save it now. Uh, you, you couldn't yesterday for some reason, but you can save it. You can look about it later. If you don't, it'll be gone in about five days. Uh, but that'll give you all the scripture and a lot of the key points in my message if you want to hold on to them. It's a Great. I actually went to visit Josh last year at his church, and they were doing this. I'm like, well, this is kind of cool. So I looked into it, and I started doing it with our teenagers. And so every time I come in here with you guys, I've been using it. Uh, so it's just it's a great thing. If you don't have the app, I encourage you to download the Uversion Bible app or a Bible app, period, because there's tons of them. But I just particularly like the Uversion. Uh, did it work? Did it work? Sweet. Fantastic. Uh, it's, a, it's a great thing. So we have been dealing... Or last week, we started dealing with this question is what are we chasing in life? Or the question essentially is this right here. The next, there we go. What fills your cup and satisfies your soul? Because there's a reality in our life, and I wasn't gonna pull this out until at the end, but it's not a snake, don't worry. Um, that'd be trippy. Uh, so for... If it's all about getting to the right perspective, right? And so if we really look at this, and this gives us a genuine or a, a different look at this, if this was our life and this rope, right? And just imagine this side doesn't end, but this little blue right here represents your life on earth, and this is you in eternity. It's shifting our perspective to realize how much we chase in this world that only affects this part of our life, our existence, and how much eternal significance we leave out because we don't shift our perspective. And this chase over the things that we're talking about like last week, we talked about love and how love we chase love so much uh, to the point that we have to have it to be filled, uh, whether it be uh, uh, if you're single and you just have to have a relationship, or even in your marriage, how we put so much pressure on the other person to fill us up and to make us complete that we're always in a place we're not satisfied. It's because we're always living in a place where we're always focused on just this little bit of uh, our time here on earth, and we don't think about the eternal significance of what's happening next. We put so much focus on the chases of the things of this world that we don't chase things that actually are significant when it comes to eternity, right? And we do this quite a bit and with different things. And we talked about uh, love was our first one we talked about all last week because we have to talk about love. It's one of the greatest things that we have, but it's one of the greatest things that pull us away from God is this chase for this worldly love, this horizontal love. And it, I'm not going to go over the, the whole message, but I encourage you, if you weren't here last week, to go back and check it out, YouTube, uh, Facebook, or whatever. But it, it's there. But this week, I wanted to take a little bit different route. Uh, but before we get into the other drugs, because we talked about love, now we're going to talk about the other drugs, I wanted to start where we ended last week, which is in Psalms 23. Because what it really comes down to is, is God enough for us? This is something that we have to ask ourselves to get to the place in our life that our perspectives change instead of focusing so much on what little time we have on earth, we think about our life at an eternal aspect, right? And when it really comes down to satisfying our soul, the only thing that's ever going to do that is God. And we see that here in Psalms 23, because if you think about the things that we chase, we're often looking for some kind of contentment, some kind of peace, rest, all these things. And he already tells us right here that God provides these things. Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing, which really speaks out to contentment. Have you ever been in a place where, man, I just don't feel content? Well, maybe God can provide that. Well, he can provide that for you if you just shift your perspective. He makes me lie down in green pastures, which talk about rest. He leads me besides quiet waters, which talk about peace. He refreshes my soul, which talks about recharging us, which we all need at times. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake, which is about direction. Uh, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil, safety, for you are with me. Your, your rod and your staff, they comfort me, protection. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows, provision. 
Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. His goodness. That was it, right? Yep. So all these things that David is reminding us that God will provide these things, so we'll stop chasing things in this world looking for these things. When God is the answer to all of life's questions. He is the answer to all of this, this chase that we're, we're going on constantly. So he offers all these things, and we essentially search for in other places. Uh, love being the big one, right? But there's so many other drugs in life that we chase. And in student ministry, we took a different route because we talked about sex a lot. We talked about intimacy. We talked about uh, social stress and all the different things. But I wanted to take a different route in here because we have a much different audience. But first of all, we got to clarify what drugs are. And no, we're not talking about weed. We're not talking about any of these substances. It's not what this, the drug's about. If I want to do that, there are some other people I'd probably pull up here because they can speak a lot more passionately about these things, but I'm not going there. Uh, but no, it's not about the substance, right? Uh, today isn't about the substance that we call drugs, but more about the things in our lives that we run to for immediate self-fulfillment. The addictions in our lives that we feel that we have to have to be fulfilled to be satisfied, to be content. And you know what? The ultimate struggle isn't the drug itself. It's the fact that it leads us to the feeling that we absolutely need these things to feel something, right? We chase these things in our life because it makes us feel something. It makes us get to a place that we feel like we need to be. And the reality is that deep down we're searching for something else. But let's look at a few things that are on a bigger scale that we pour into and don't always reward us. And look, on a sidebar, these things that we're talking about, like love uh, and, and these different things that we're about to approach, when God gave us these things, they were blessings. Like love, for us to understand and embrace love is a blessing. But the issue is, is that when we take what he's given us and we've taken it outside of his original purpose, and once we do that, then it turns into something that, that leads into a place that's not satisfying. And I think about sex. I know we don't like to, we don't talk about sex a lot, obviously, but sex was created as a beautiful thing. When God gave it to us, he gave it to, between two, a man and a woman, a husband and a wife to fulfill their, their multiplications, right? But also it feels good. It's, it's nice. We enjoy it. He gave it to us, right? If it, if it wasn't, like if it wasn't a, a, place where he wanted us to feel good about it, we'd go around high-fiving and impregnate people. I mean, it'd be weird. It'd just be weird, right? No, he gave us a completely intimate, and it's a beautiful thing. But outside of God's purpose, once we take it outside of what he planned, then it turns into something that doesn't fill us up anymore, right? Once we take it out of marriages, we take it out of the original intention, then God's blessing is no longer on it, and it turns into something that it shouldn't be. And then it we keep chasing after it more and more, hoping that it will fill us, and we end up in, down a crazy place that is full of not being satisfied, full of unfulfillment, right? And so all these things that we talk about aren't necessarily originally uh, bad things, but it's when we take it out of the scope of who God is. But let, let's pray before we really get into this. Father God, I just thank you so much for your word. Thank you for allowing me to be your messenger, Lord. I just pray that I'll just be your lips today. That it be your desire here this morning, your purpose. And I just thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for all the people that are here this morning, all the people watching on Facebook. And we pray that your spirit would move, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's talk about the first one, the first other drug. And this one is, it might throw you for a loop. And I'm saying it's family. You're like, family? That's, that's kind of weird to talk about as a drug. But, and I'm not necessarily talking biologically, but anybody who has an incredible influence on you. Because how can a family be a drug? But remember, this is about self-fulfillment. What gives you greater self-satisfaction than when you get, to get the approval of your loved ones, right? When others have such an impact on you in your life that their words and actions sway your words and actions. But on the other side of that, on what impacts you more and shifts you uh, than the disapproval of your family? What moves you more? And, and it's a crazy thought, but here, here's the reality. 
I said this years ago. It might have been right after I got married. But I have this incredible, and I can say this because she's not here today, this incredible uh, ability to control my wife. Yep, I said it. And she's not watching because I'm pretty sure she's still asleep. All right? Will I say it in the second service? I don't know. We'll see. But I have this incredible control, ability to control my wife. I know exactly what to say that will make her give me a look that will get me to do whatever she wants. Right? I can do that. I can give her give that ability. Right? But the reality is, all jokes aside, I love my wife so much. And even her facial expressions will sway my thought process at times because of our connection, our relationship, right? Uh, because I value her and I desire to uh, have a peaceful relationship, uh, it makes a difference. It makes a difference when you're connected with somebody, they have the opportunity to move you and to sway you. And that could be a great thing. Again, under God's blessing, it's a beautiful thing to have those relationships. But outside of God's blessings, People can sway you in a whole different direction and away from God, right? If, and I've seen it over and over and over that people get passionate about the Lord and their parents are like, or because I work with teenagers, and I, parents are like, uh, why are you so involved with church? Why are you so passionate about praying? You need to slow down on this kind of stuff. And, it, and you're like, what? what are you doing? Why are we doing this to each other? We should move us like iron sharpening iron in, in, in a great direction. But sometimes the influence of the people around us will pull us away from God, which is not naturally what he desires. There is weight in the chase for provo- approval. Small, medium, large decisions in life can greatly impact my desire to get approval for others. Listen, the nature of your relationship should not dictate your devotion to God. Your devotion should dictate the nature of your relationships, right? Let me say that again. The nature of your relationships should not dictate your devotion to God. Your devotion should dictate the the nature of your relationships, right? Your passion and your desire to know God should affect the people around you rather than allowing the people around you to affect you the other way. And listen, I get this. I started a ministry in 2016 I was called, first of all, back up. I was raised uh, my whole life in the Church of Christ. Some of you might know that. Some of you don't know that. Uh, My whole life, my whole family is Church of Christ. If you don't know anything about Church of Christ, it's very conservative. Uh, Their belief system is a little bit different. Uh, They're the ones, as you may have heard, they don't do instruments in the church or whatever, which I was a musician going to the church, which is kind of funny how that worked out. Uh, But I was raised Church of Christ, but God called me, and to the first church I served at was a Baptist church. And if you don't know anything about Church of Christ, I want to tell you this. Baptist church is like, uh, if, you, if they were two schools, it would be the rival, right? Baptist church and the eyes of Church of Christ are the, now I wouldn't say enemy, but the rival. And so when I became, uh, when I started serving in the church in 2006, I had to come to a decision in my life whether I was going to let my family influence my decision, or I'm going to let my devotion influence my decision. Because I love my family. I have a great relationship with my family. My my grandparents at the time, I'm passionate about them. I love them. My uncle was a deacon in the Church of Christ in San Antonio, had a great relationship with him. But, is that me? Dang, that's, sorry. Dang. Yeah, she's watching. Dang. Uh, (laughs) Excuse me, babe. Uh, I love you so much. I'm so sorry. Uh, that's funny. That was a good call. That was a good call. <laughs> that's good. Oh, I don't even remember what. Oh, okay. Back to it. Yeah, but there was almost a place in my life uh, that I decided I was like, I don't want to do this because I know if I do this, then my grandparents and my uncle, they would not approve of this. But then I was like, okay, this is what God is calling me to do. So I had to step through those doors, and, and you know what? There's still this uh, need for approval. For, so for two years, I didn't tell anybody. I served in the church for two years, and they didn't. my parents knew about it, and they supported me as much as they could in their mind. They thought they supported me. They would never, like, look down on me, but they're like, well, you're in a Baptist church. This is weird. But uh, they still, uh, I got you. Now they've come complete 360. My dad, you see my dad in church all the time. Of course, my mom passed away last year, but she loved me and was passionate about what I was doing, and she believed in me. 
But it's crazy how the influence of people can shift us. And we don't know what our future holds if we contently, completely hold back because we're worried about what people think. And this is not what God desires for us. Ephesians 4.14, then we will no longer be infants tossed about by the waves and carried around by every wind of teaching and by clever cunning of men and the deceitful scheming. We can't sway. The more we get involved in a relationship with God, the sturdier we become. And when we make him our priority, when he is enough, it changes everything around us. Our closest relationships should build us up, iron sharpening iron, and not move us away. There's a reason he tells us don't be yoked with unbelievers. Because being yoked with somebody will sway you in a direction. And it happens all the time within the church. And even I had a great friend in college that felt called to the ministry. And then he got tied up with a girl who was not passionate about this. And he has not been serving the church since. And that was almost 15 years ago. Because when we get yoked, we get connected with people, it can sway us. It can change us. Uh, because a lot of us, too, are this something called people pleasers. Right? We're always trying to satisfy people rather than God. And, it, and this is a drug. And the next drug I want to talk about is success. Success, again, there's nothing wrong with having a great job, having money, having these things, having the toys and all these things. But when it becomes our ultimate chase in life, then that's where it starts to get a little hairy. hairy. Success can be measured in many ways. But one definition of success is the attainment of fame, wealth, or social status. The, the desire to have more because maybe you didn't have it growing up or in your mind. Uh, that's how you know that you made it because you had these things. But the reality is this chase gets in the way of our commitment to God at times. Mark 10 is a great example of the rich young ruler. We're not going to read it because I have a lot more, a little bit to read. But there's this guy goes up to Jesus and say, what do I got to do and inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, so here's the commandments. And the guy's like, I did all of them. And then he says, all right, now go home and, and sell all of your stuff. He's like, almost had me. I was that close. Because this chase for more, this chase for possession, this chase for having everything that we ever dreamed of can ultimately get in the way of our devotion to God. Again, I can't stress enough, these things in itself aren't bad. It's what, how we deal with them. If it's our ultimate chase that we, we push away our family, we push away our friends, we push away ultimately God because we desire to have more and more and more and more, then we're missing it, right? It no longer becomes a blessing in our life. We're not, we're not using it to honor God. In fact, it's pushing him away because we're chasing these things that don't satisfy. I think that we are more in love with the idea of success than we are about the actual having it. We love the chase. Listen, girls, let me tell you something. If you make him, uh, make him wonder, you, may, you, you encourage the chase, he's going to want you that much more. I'm just saying, that's how we operate. Because we like the chase, right? So I remember a couple of years ago, uh, well, I, right after Harvey, I, I realized that I enjoy working with Wood. I wouldn't say I'm amazing at it. I just enjoy it. I really do. And so there was this period for a year there that I, I shifted from I need to have more guns to I need to have more tools, right? Unfortunately, that desire is still there. But, uh, but I remember, so I was building my shop. I uh, had a table saw was given to me. had these different things. Then I had it in my mind that I needed a planer, a wood planer, tabletop planer. And all of a sudden, so I did some research, and I found in all of its glory right? A DeWalt benchtop planter, 15 amp, 20,000 RPM, 13 inch cuts with three knives. And it was beautiful. And I had to have this. It became a part of who I am. I'm like, this has to come in my life somehow. All right. So for three weeks, I was just envisioning this thing. Like, I have to have this thing. It's got to be in my shop. I don't care if it's $600. I got to have this thing. And so for a few weeks, it just become, and then finally I start you know how we do with our wives, like I slowly integrated it to the conversation, like we do, right? Like, oh man, I wish I really had this. It would really work a lot better. And then, and then after a week, I finally had Skylar's approval. Um, and then I finally got it. I remember the day, I know this is sad. I know it's sad, but I remember the day we got done eating dinner. We were going to go to Lowe's afterwards because Lowe's, that particular Lowe's is the only one that had it within a 50-mile radius, did my research. Uh, and I was like, I have to have this thing. And so the whole time at, at dinner, I'm like, 
All right, hurry up, eat that, baby. Let's go, come on. Let's go. And then we get to Lowe's. I pull out my car, get it, put it in my truck, drive home. I didn't even get my daughter out of the truck. Like, well, my wife, you can handle that. I'm getting my planer, all right? It doesn't matter. And on, on the side of the box, it had a picture of two guys lifting it, saying that you need to have two guys. Did that, did that listen to that? No. All right, grab man, handle that, threw it in my shed, took it out of the box like a kid at Christmas, right? I was excited. I put it on the table, and I just sat there and stared at it for a good five minutes. But then all that excitement, all that stuff, to that point, you're like, what now? What now? Now I've got to use it. But I just remember that point. I'm like, all that anticipation, all that excitement and that. Okay, now i got it. What's next? Right? We do it with our cell phones all the time, getting the newest and greatest version. And we get it. We're excited about it. And then we get it. And after 10 minutes of using it, like, that's really no different my other phone. Like, literally, nothing. My camera's a little bit better, right, for my selfies. But anyways. <laughs> We do that all the time because we, we chase for things and more, and it consumes us, this chase. And then we read verses like Colossians 3, 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. <sighs> Missed it. Missed it. Proverbs eleven twenty eight. 28, those who trust in their riches will fall, but the, rich, the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Missed it. Right? And I, again, not saying possessions are bad. I'm not saying I'm, I'm going to buy more tools. Let's be honest here. Right? It's going to happen. But this chase or this need to have more or chase to have, uh, have a, in our minds a better life because we can get rich or get more money in the bank account. And we're missing out on being present with our kids and, and our family because we're chasing after this idea rather than living in the present and, and honoring God with what we have. And then the, the last one we want to talk about is time. Does anybody remember in the early 90s, we had something that we don't have now. It's called boredom, right? Do you guys ever remember like taking a road trip and sitting in a car and there was absolutely nothing to do but stare out a window? Y'all remember those days? Y'all don't, right? Or uh, standing in line at a store and all you had to do was either stand there in silence or talk to the next person next to us if you're an extrovert. The introverts were like, oh, crap, these people are talking to me. That's, that's usually what happened. They're like, why is this guy talking to me? Right? That's all we had to do. Now, pull out our phone and start skimming or whatever um, because the technology is here. Or do you remember actually waiting on a bus stop uh, or sitting in a theater before a movie or being stuck in traffic? Uh, sitting in class after you finished your work, you sat there in silence. Anybody remember doing these things with nothing for your mind to do but wander through the infinite realm of possibilities? Now? Now we do this, right? We have infinity in our hands, all the knowledge and information and YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and all these things that we can grab a hold of right here. And you know what? None of us, I mean, if we all took a vote right here and say, would you go back to that time? Most of us would say no. We like technology. We like it in our hands. We like uh, having the ability to Google whatever we want. Uh, getting, we think we're getting more done at any given time because we can sit in line, stand in line and still text and connect with people. But if time is our drug of choice and we choose life, that is busy. We like to be busy. We fill our schedules with all kinds of different things, jobs, which we kind of have to have, extracurricular. We put our kids in all kinds of events and activities. Uh, we like it. We won't admit it. We say, oh, I just can't. I wish things would slow down. But when things do slow down, we feel like we have to do more. We always fill our schedule. We feel like we have to be busy. Uh, we have to be in this place where we're, we're doing stuff all the time. Now, not only do we fill our schedules, we even fill our dead times. When we're in line, we get on the phone. Like there's no downtime for our mind to shut down and just think. Uh, John Mark Comer said, we now have access to infinity through our new digital selves, which is great, but we've lost something crucial. All those little moments of boredom were potential portals to conversations with our God. Little moments throughout our days to wake up to the reality of God all around us, to wake up our world, to draw our mind's attention, and with it, devotion back to God. 
to come off the hurry drug and come home to awareness. There's a survey that Microsoft put out that said that 77% of young adults answered yes when asked, when nothing is occupying my attention, the first thing I do is reach for my phone. And this is not young adults. This is everyone. And when when I started really digging into this message, man, conviction came all over me. Because even like a red light, right? You can judge me. I know half of y'all do that, if not most of y'all. We, and it's, it's a natural desire. It's become a part of who we are. Rather than sit and just think and spend a little time with God in those little moments, and all those little moments add up to greater moments. Right? This is why and I thought about pastor on a lawnmower. This is why he's so efficient on a lawnmower, because he's not on his phone or not doing these things. Or when I mean, I've done the same thing on a lawnmower, although I plug and listen to music too, so that might mess it up, but... Because when we sit in silence and sit in these things, I love when Josiah was talking about uh, sitting in, in the peace and just getting away and spending time with the Lord. It's so important and because we filled up our schedule so much. When busy is the foundation of our lives, we have to admit that it has a profound implication for our apprenticeship to Jesus and our experiences or lack of experiences of life that we, he has to offer. Right? We are to be Christ-like. We are to be his ambassadors. And we're missing all these opportunities to grow in that. Because we love to be busy. We love to fill our schedules. In many cases, this desire to be busy ourselves uh, in our activities or personal weather has the potential to rob us of the ability to be present. Present to God. Present with other people. Present uh, to all that is good and beautiful and true of the world, even present to our own souls. It robs us sometimes. And I sit at home sometimes at the end of a long day, and I just want to sit in my chair and, and relax and, and look up stuff on my phone, and my daughter's over here, Dad, hey, let's play with me. And I don't want to, right? I want to be lazy. I, I want to shut down. But then I'm missing this. I'm, I'm not being present, right? I'm not being in the moment. This And it, sometimes it really, really hits me. It's like, If this is the memory my daughter's going to have of me when I get older, of her childhood, is daddy on a phone all the time. And like, man, I'm I'm missing out here. I'm missing it. And what if God has that same thought? He's like, I have so much to share with you, but we're just down here. Or doing other things. Now, it's not always a phone, but other things. We're we're robbing ourselves of this time. Um, And it's a a shocking reality. I'm going to skip this next quote. The shocking reality. So in 2000, uh, there was the t- 2000 and the di- before the digital revolution, our attention span was 12 seconds, which is kind of shocking. 12 seconds that you can truly focus on something without any extra thought coming in our mind. So that was before digital world. Now, or I think it was 2017 when they came out with the next one, eight seconds is our attention span. And you think four seconds is not that big a deal. Let me give you a little perspective. A goldfish. Their attention span is nine seconds. That's right. We're losing to goldfish, right? It's crazy. They're killing us. It's crazy. But that, it's true. Because of this digital age, because we're always being consumed, we, we, we have a hard time uh, staying focused. This is why a lot of us have that excuse, well, I can't spend a lot of time in prayer because my mind wanders. Or when I read the Word of God, my mind wanders. It's because we've built ourselves to that place. Doesn't mean we can't go back and shift it. It just takes a little extra work, and we can get to that place. Uh, Not only are we going, are we being consumed with busy? We're teaching our kids to do the same thing. And I look around in restaurants, and parents are on the phone. Listen, I've been guilty. I'm not throwing throwing shade at just you. Uh, Parents are on the phone. The kids are on their phones, and the babies are on tablets. And I'm like, and you laugh, but it happens all the time. You know it's true. And we're missing being present with our families because of these things, right? And in in that, we're missing out and being present with God because we are uh, constantly doing this, and and it just becomes habit, and we don't even realize it. We're missing it. So whether it's our chase, and listen, I understand a busy schedule, and I understand that the value that it has on, on some of these things, but where we're losing the precious moments to be present. 
we're losing them. And whether it's our chase for love, whether it's approval of our family, our friends, our success, or time, this chase is crowding our ability to connect with God. This chase is crowding our ability to chase after God. There's this incredible moment. So I'm, I'm about to just take you on a journey real quick. Yeah, I got time. Okay. Last, last week I went a little late. I'm going to try to be a little bit. Probably not. We'll see what happens. All right. So uh, what are they going to do? Fire me. I'm not your pastor. Come on. Let's go. Uh, anyways, I'm going to take you on a little journey starting in Matthew 3. And ultimately, when we want to figure out how to do life, we look at who? Jesus, obviously. Because if we want to call ourselves Christians or Christ-like, then we strive to have a life that looks like Christ. And so our time is no different than that. So Matthew 3, 16 through 17, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and aligning on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. So this is the beginning, right after this will be the beginning of him living, or ministry, we'll just say ministry, right? The beginning of ministry for him. So he was baptized, he comes out of the water, but what's interesting is what happens next. What is it? Does he go instantly go into the fill to minister, or what happens? Look at the very next verse in chapter 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And at first, as I read that, and I thought about, man, wow, you can be baptized. All right, go in the wilderness. Be bat- or, you know, get, get uh, all these distractions and let the enemy tackle you, whatever. But if you really read this and how it comes out, he actually spends 40 days with the Lord, and then the devil starts messing with him. So what's incredible about this and we're about to just go on a little journey. The first thing what happens when he baptized, he's led to the desert. In this passage, the Greek translation of the word offered for desert doesn't necessarily mean sand or uh, heat. It's actually from the word eremos, the Greek word eremos, which has many English meanings. Here, here's a bunch of them. Uh, desert, deserted place, desolate place, solitary place, one of my favorite, quiet place, or wilderness. So there are actually so many places in the gospel that you see this relationship between Jesus and the Eremos, right? I'm probably butchering that word. I don't know. I don't speak Greek. Uh, But yeah, his Eremos, there's this obvious relationship between the two. And so as we keep reading, as we dig in, um, we look at, and you know what? I always thought, first of all, I thought this is kind of odd. Right? He's, Jesus was baptized and God sends him into a place alone, knowing what was about to take place. I'm like, it makes more sense that he would have done this and like, oh, maybe and then God would just like, all is cool. Of course, he's God and he's man at the same time. And then he's baptized and then starts ministry. No, he's baptized, started his ministry, goes in the wilderness, spends 40 days with the Lord, and then here comes the enemy. And a lot of times we see this as a place of weakness, but rather looking at it as a place of weakness, maybe we need to look at this as a place uh, of growth and power. Maybe we have it backwards. Maybe instead of looking at the wilderness as a place of weakness, maybe we'll look at a place of strength. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness because it was there that Jesus was at the height of his power and connection to God in his Eremos. He just spent some incredible present moments with God. Again, present moments with God. And then the enemy showed his face. Because of his time with God, when the enemy attacked, Jesus had the capacity to take on the devil himself and walk away untouched. Right? He walked away from there untouched and tackling everything the enemy had threw at him. Because he just spent an incredible amount of time with God. And so if we fast forward right after that moment, we pick up in Mark 1. So Mark 1, like I said, we're we're going on a journey here. Mark 1 is essentially his first day of ministry, essentially, and it's a full day. He starts off in the morning uh, teaching in the synagogue. Then he spent time at Peter's house at lunch. Remember, healed his mother-in-law, hangs out there for a little bit. And then he was late healing the sick and demonized. You can read chapter 1, figure it out for yourself. But at this point, he spent all day serving. And then all probably all night, you can imagine, he's tired. He's worn out. Mentally exhausted. Spiritually, he's he's exhausted. I mean, he he went through a crazy day. And what does he do? He goes to sleep, and he wakes up next morning. First of all, if any of you guys had a 
exhausting day from early morning to late night, what are you going to do the next morning or you desire? Probably going to sleep in, grab some breakfast, right? Hang out with some family, watch some TV. But obviously, Jesus did not. Mark 135, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place. You guessed it, his Eremos, where he prayed. So he spent 40 days spending time with God. Enemy attacked, all right, went to bed, woke up, had a full day of ministry. And then where do you go next? He went back to the place with God, back to his Eremos, right? You would think maybe it'll be a week or two before he did that, which for a lot of us, before we spend some true quality alone time with God, usually another week or two weeks or sometimes, if not more. But no, the very next morning, he went and spent time with God. Jesus was with, in his Eremos. Just to clarify, he spent a month and a half in the quiet place. Come back to Capernaum, served one day, then he returned to this quiet place. The quiet place wasn't just something he did once because it produced great results. It became an active part of his lifestyle. Right? It's e easy to find that quiet time when it's convenient for us, but if it's not a part of our active life, then we're going to miss it. And look what Jesus did the very next morning. He went there. He went back to the place. But wait, there's more, right? Uh, Mark 136, Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they explained, everyone is looking for you. So let me paraphrase for you. He woke up the next morning, was spending time with God. He's, again, he just spent the full day yesterday. And then he got, gets out of his quiet time. His disciples come and chase him down. And he's saying, basically, bro, look what just happened, right? You, you just moved so big in this place. These people want more of it. Like you just went viral. There was a YouTube video of you uh, chasing out a demon and people are catching on. And they want you back. And what's interesting about his response, because in ministry we do this a lot too, like, okay, uh, there's opportunity there, so it's obviously what God wants for us to go. But he spent so much time in his Eremos that he was connected with God, and he knew exactly the path that he was supposed to take. And so what was his response here? What did he say in Mark 138? Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I've come. His response to their desire is no. He said, no, listen, this is not where I'm supposed to be going. I got to go this direction. And so Jesus came out of the wilderness with all sorts of clarity for his identity and calling. He was grounded, centered, in touch with God himself. And from that place, he knew precisely what to say yes to, and just as importantly, what to say no to. But wait, there's more. It sounds nice. Time alone with Jesus, Paul and Galilee, right? Uh, and Mark 6, I got ahead of myself there. His response was no. Mark 6, disciples got so caught up in the mission that they didn't even have an opportunity to grab a meal. Jesus says, come with me uh, by yourselves to a quiet place. You guess it, to the Eremos to get some rest. So they're doing ministry, chapter 6. He's with his disciples. They're doing a lot, and he's recognized his disciples are getting depleted. He's all right, now you need to spend time in the Eremos. And he grabs them and takes them. And this is where we can really compare it to life right here. Uh, in Mark 6, 33, it says, But many who saw them leaving, see, they're about to leave, go to their Eremos, and recognize them. They ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day. So on their way out to get rest, they were bombarded, and Jesus had the compassion on them, so they stayed, and they worked it out, and they continued to press. This is real life. This is real life. We sometimes have the best intentions to spend time with him, to get in our Eremos, but life happens, right? Some sets time, we set time to the side and say, all right, we're going to spend that morning uh, with God, and we're going to talk to him and, and pray with him, but things happen. Sometimes work comes up. Sometimes your child swallows a Lego, right? Uh, sometimes your spouse had a rough day and they just need to talk. Sometimes thousands of people are beating your door down and asking to heal them, right? Life happens. 
and you feel that you don't have any time, and Jesus was right there. The crowd was large. He sympathized, so we fed them. 5,000 plus meals later, this is where we're at. They're exhausted, they're tired, but wait, there's more. Mark 6, 45, immediately Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd after leaving them, he went up on the mountainside to pray. Something tells me if a perfect human, a.k.a. Jesus, right, needs his eremos, we who are not perfect need it that much more. We need our eremos. We need that place. And usually for us, I mean, in Luke 6, or not Luke 6, Luke, the book, uh, it has at least nine places where Jesus went to his Eremos, at least. And what's interesting about Luke's perspective, if you actually follow it and put it on an axis, the greater he became popular and his schedule got crazier and crazier, the greater his moments and his Eremoses became, right? The more he poured into his time with God, the crazier his schedule would get or vice versa. What's crazy about that is us, we're the opposite. The crazier and busier life gets, the less time we devote to him. The quiet place is the first thing to go rather than the first go-to. Right? When life gets crazy, we put him on a back burner. Jesus did the exact opposite. The crazier life gets, the more time he spent with him. Because he understood the value of the Aramos. We say to ourselves, well, when life slows down, then we'll get a little more devoted. What if you didn't have those things in your life? What if it did slow down? The reality is, is we have packed our schedule with much more because we love to be busy. We love to consume ourselves. And God's sitting there like, I have so much to offer you and to teach you and to build in you that you're missing it because we're so focused right here on the present and the little time we have on earth we're so focused on this rather than any of this. Like, the more you spend time on him, it's going to affect this much. The, more, the less time is only going to affect this much in our life. And he says, I want more of you. I want to be enough for you. In Luke 9, 23, we'll go ahead and close up, Josiah. Luke 9, 23, he said to them all, if a man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever will save his life shall lose it, but whoever lo will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Well, Jesus is talking about a bunch of people that don't have our schedules and our responsibilities. Maybe, and you might be right in thinking that, but they were risking their actual lives to be devoted, not their time or their relationships. They were actually risking their lives. What are we risking? We're risking a little, a little extra downtime somewhere here and there, or we're risking our schedule, risking our jobs, risking our valuable time because we're chasing these things that won't give us satisfaction. When he says, I am enough. Listen, it says, take up your cross daily. Drugs are all about instant satisfaction, but real life is a process. You want true contentment, you have to put in the work. You want fullness and satisfaction, put the work in and build a relationship that has eternal significance and not temporary satisfaction. This is what we need to chase, this perspective here. That it's about eternity, eternity with God, and how we live our life, the moments of being present will affect, yes, now, but will affect eternity as well. Is he enough? Here's the issue. This needs to be our perspective, but there's a reality that this is our perspective. This is the reality. This is how we're living our lives. If I could just have one more thing, then I'll be satisfied. And then we get that, and then we add one more thing. And then when we finally get all these things that we always dreamed of, we're still not satisfied. We want more and more. And God's trying to tell us, hey, I am enough. 
I am enough for you. No, we keep chasing. We keep adding these things. And because we add these things, we add more sin to our life, which gets us further away from the Lord. And before we know it, we got a bunch of chains wrapping around us and holding us back and weighing us down. And we're trying to move forward. And we keep weighing ourselves down that much more. And we're living a life of chains rather than, hey, let's look at our life as eternal significance, right? Let's stop worrying so much about this little time that we have on earth and really think about, all right, eternity is going to have much bigger grasp on who we are. So let's focus on that a little more, that God is enough. And when we make him enough, right, we value the things he does. And then we start impacting not only our life, but the, the lives around us. And not only do we impact our eternity, we impact everybody else's eternity. Right now we're focusing on this right here. We're focused on changing our little blue area. And in turn, we're trying to help others improve their little blue area. Or rather, we need to focus on eternity. I was talking to a group of guys not too long ago about, we are talking about several, like, like um, Jehovah's Witness. We were talking about Muslims and like, just their lifestyles and and how you know we don't agree with obviously what they believe in their theology or all that uh, but there is an ounce of respect of their commitment an ounce of respect that they would like even even Muslims I know we it's, it's a terrible thing to think about what's happened with the radical Muslims it's not all Muslims but what they would do for their eternity in their minds and yet we're just consumed about today and we have truth we have God and we have truth and we have the knowledge of Jesus who brings true salvation and freedom and release. And we have the key to the kingdom. And yet we hold back because we're focused on now, focused on our time now, and focused on our, our little blue moment and not on eternity. Is God enough? This is something that we all have to individually decide for ourselves. And this is what's going to change in our Aramos, change our devotion, change our commitment, and then gives us the freedom to live in a way that honors Him. And we don't worry about other people. We don't stress about our jobs as much. I'm not, we're still human, right? And we're all these different things. But when chasing God, it changes everything because He is our priority. Something to think about. Would you just bow your heads for a second? I just want you to just gnaw on this thought for a little bit. Is he enough for me? Is he enough? What are you chasing? If we could have a, a pure, honest moment, and we're not going to look around. I just want to have a pure, honest moment. I want you to raise your hand if you genuinely think that you're chasing things that aren't of God. Come on, let's just be honest, that we're living a life chasing things that aren't the things that God wants us to have. Yeah, hands all, all over the building. You can put your hands down. Now raise your hand if you know that, but you wanna live a life that God is enough. Yeah, hands all over the building. We have to change our perspective, church. We've got to change our hearts. He has got to be enough. Father God, I just thank you so much for your truth. Thank you so much for providing peace and contentment and joy. Father, yes, there's heartache and, and there's still life, but Lord, you produce an eternal satisfaction that we will never get in all these other places that we're chasing. And I pray that we would receive that understanding and that we would shift our perspective, that we would put in the work, that we make you a priority. The busier our schedules get, the more time we spend with you. Father, Father, help us find our Eremos. And I thank you for what you're doing, Lord. And I just pray that you would shift hearts this morning, that this wouldn't just be a good message and then we go home and, and do life exactly the same, but we would shift things that we would make you enough, Lord, in our life, that we would stop chasing these things that have no eternal significance, that you would be enough, Father. You are worthy. You are worthy. Forgive us for we have failed you. 
Father, and there's somebody here that doesn't know you, that has the weight of the world on their shoulders, that are carrying around all this baggage, Lord. I pray that they would place their faith in you today and they would walk away here changed. Father, help them start a relationship today. Help them start their Eremos today. Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give it up for our Lord. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Appreciate you guys sticking with me for the last two weeks. Uh, this, is a, this is a great message for all of us, not just you guys, for me too. As I'm digging into this and I'm realizing how much time that I'm I'm filling my schedule and all these kind of things and, and, and realizing that my Eremos is suffering too, right? So I just encourage you this week. And you know, I know get real serious and all these different things, but there is a joy in the Lord that comes with this. There is a joy. Not saying there's no heartache. There is that too. But there is a joy like no other when we trust the Lord and make him enough for our lives. Uh, love you guys. We're going to, uh, if our servant leaders would come forward, we're going to have a time, an opportunity for you to give. Um, this is in all honor of the Father. This, is, this isn't this is your devotion to a pastor or myself or this church. This is your devotion to the Lord and honoring him and his house. So uh, there's envelopes in the back of your uh, chairs or whatever those things called. Pews. There we go. Uh, so you want to grab one of those, fill it out. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm stuck in my thought right now. I'm right there. All right, let's say this. As we give today, believe in God for jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates, returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. All right, David, you want to go ahead and do the announcement?